the Taliban were secret partners with the oil giant Unical in building an oil pipeline across Afghanistan. And when a Clinton official was reminded that the Taliban persecuted women, he said, we can live with that. There is compelling evidence that Bush decided to attack Afghanistan not as a result of 9-11, but two months earlier in July 2001. This is virtually unknown in the United States, publicly. Like the scale of civilian casualties in Afghanistan. To my knowledge, only one mainstream reporter, Jonathan Steele of The Guardian in London, has investigated civilian casualties in Afghanistan. His estimate is 20,000 dead civilians, and that was three years ago. The enduring tragedy of Palestine is due in great part, great part, to the silence and com com compliance of the so-called liberal left. Hamas is described repeatedly as sworn to the destruction of Israel. The New York Times, Associated Press, the Boston Globe, take your pick. They'll, they'll all use this line as a standard disclaimer, and it's false. That Hamas has called for a 10-year ceasefire is almost never reported. Even more important, that Hamas has undergone an historic ideological shift in the last few years, which amounts to a recognition of what it calls the reality of Israel, is virtually unknown. And that Israel is sworn to the destruction of Palestine is unspeakable. There is a pioneering study done by Glasgow University on the reporting of Palestine. They interviewed young people who watched TV news in Britain. More than 90% thought the illegal settlers were Palestinian. The more they watched, the less they knew, in Danny Schechter's famous phrase. The current most dangerous silence is over nuclear weapons and the return of the Cold War. The Russians understand clearly that the so-called American defense shield in Eastern Europe is designed to subjugate and humiliate them. Yet the front pages here talk about Putin starting a new Cold War, and there is silence about the development of an entirely new American nuclear system called Reliable Weapons Replacement, RRW, which is designed to blur the distinction between conventional war and nuclear war, a long-held ambition. In the meantime, Iran is being softened up, with the liberal media playing almost the same role it played before the Iraq invasion. And as for the Democrats, look at how Barack Obama has become the voice of the Council on Foreign Relations, one of the propaganda organs of the old liberal Washington establishment. Obama writes that he wants the troops home, and I quote, we must not rule out military force against long-standing adversaries such as Iran and Syria, unquote. Listen to this from the liberal Obama, and I quote, At moment of great peril in the past century, our leaders ensured that America, by deed and by example, led and lifted the world, that we stood for and fought for the freedom sought by billions of people beyond our borders, unquote. You know, that's the nub of the propaganda, the brainwashing, if you like, that seeps into the lives of every American and many of us who are not Americans. From right to left, secular to God-fearing. What so few people know is that in the last half century, United States administrations have overthrown 50 governments many of them democracies. In the process, 30 countries have been attacked and bombed with the loss of countless lives. Bush bashing is all very well and is justified. But the moment we begin to accept the siren call of the Democrats' drivel about standing up and fighting for freedom sought by billions, the battle for history is lost 
and we ourselves are silenced. So what should we do? That question often asked in meetings I've addressed, even meetings as informed as those in this conference, is itself interesting. It's my experience that people in the so-called third world rarely ask the question because they know what to do. And some are paid with their freedom and their lives, but they knew what to do. It's a question that many on the, the democratic left, small d, have yet to answer. Real information, subversive information, remains the most potent power of all, and I believe we must not fall into the trap of believing that the media speaks for the public. That wasn't true in Stalinist Czechoslovakia, and it isn't true in Bush's United States. In all the years I've been a journalist, I've never known public consciousness to have risen as fast as it's rising today. Yes, its direction and shape is unclear, partly because people are now deeply suspicious of political alternatives and because the Democratic Party has succeeded in seducing and dividing the electoral left. And yet this growing critical public awareness is all the more remarkable when you consider the sheer scale of indoctrination, the mythology of a superior way of life, and the current manufactured state of fear. Why did the New York Times come clean in that editorial last year? Not because it opposes Bush's wars. Look at the coverage of Iran. That, edit that editorial was a rare acknowledgement that the public were beginning to see the concealed role of the media that people were beginning to read between the lines. If Iran is attacked, the reaction and the upheaval cannot be predicted. The National Security and Homeland Security Presidential Directive gives Bush power over all facets of government in an emergency. It's not unlikely the Constitution will be suspended, the laws to round up hundreds of thousands of so-called terrorists and enemy combatants, combatants are already on the books. <clears throat> That's not paranoia to be understanding of that. I believe that these dangers are understood by the public who have come a long way since 9-11 and a long way since the propaganda that linked Saddam Hussein to Al-Qaeda. That's why they voted for the Democrats last November only to be betrayed. But they need truth. And journalists ought to be agents of truth, not the courtiers of power. I believe a fifth estate is possible, the product of a people's movement that monitors, deconstructs, and counters the media, the corporate media. In every university, in every media college, in every newsroom, teachers of journalism and journalists themselves need to ask themselves about the part they now play in the bloodshed in the name of a bogus objectivity. Such a movement within the media could herald a perestroika of a kind we've never known. This is all possible. Silences can be broken. In Britain, the National Union of Journalists has undergone a radical change and has called for a boycott of Israel. The website... The website medialens.org has single-handedly called the BBC to account. In the United States, wonderfully free, rebellious spirits populate the web. I can't mention them all here, but from Tom Feely's International Clearinghouse to Mike Albert's Znet to Counterpunch Online and the splendid work of FAIR. The best reporting of Iraq appears on the web. Daja Miles, courageous journalism... <laughs> And and citizen reporters like Joe Wilding, who reported the siege of Fallujah from inside the city. In Venezuela, Greg Wilpert's investigations turned back much of the virulent propaganda now aimed at 
Hugo Chavez. Make no mistake, it's the threat of freedom of speech for the majority in Venezuela.